Blog Talk Radio. Archangels, Ghosts, and Bigfoot, oh my, it's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now, for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others, here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girl. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, all the way from Tucson, Patricia Kirkman. PK, how are you tonight? Frustrated. Can't figure out why I'm hearing you twice. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Here we go again. Now, who's breathing into the microphone? Don't tell me we have yet another visitor. Oh, that might be. That might have been me. I, I was. You were That's to you. Okay. Was it me this time? Okay. <laughs> we have a great guest tonight who just uh, who just popped in, and his name is Mike Cleland, and we are talking about one of the most fascinating topics in the UFO field tonight with Mike. It is all about owls and UFOs and synchronicity, and so we're going to get the whole lowdown from Mike in just a little bit. But first. We have to check in with you, PK, and find out about the numbers. What is going on? The numbers are driving everyone crazy. Okay. People have difficulty sleeping. That's no question about that. But everyone do remember that this month is a review of this year. We're facing ourselves coming and going, whether we like it or not. And it is a bugger. Ugh. Today, we also are... As I said, overly tired. We don't know quite what to what to trust, what not to trust. There's secrets are popping up in different areas, or things are being made known behind the scene, but we won't be able to figure it out for, probably for the next day or two. But there's a lot going on, and I, I, I just don't even know where to start. It's just frustrating as the devil. Every one of us <laughs> are facing what's been going on all year, and if we can fine-tune some of it. We can pull some of these things together and get it off our plate before we go into next month's issues, which is going to start looking at the coming year. But this month is going to really be a bugger because everyone is overly sensitive, which makes them sometimes insensitive. So we've got a lot of things coming. And God help us with what's going on in Washington because they've got a lot of secrets that we really don't want to know. I mean, it's just crazy. Wow. Outside of that, well, life is good. Yeah, other than that, there are no problems in the world mm-hmm. today. Okay. That's right. Well, so this is a good heads up. We need to be aware of all of this. And, you know, it's funny you should mention feeling tired because I normally don't feel tired. Today I was I felt exhausted. And it's like, wow, where Everybody is this does. coming from? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a seven day. And it's a funny company. Days, okay. Sit down instead of stand, you sit. If you can lie down instead of sit, you lie down. And if you can spend time by or around water, you're going to feel great. Unless you're in the part of the country that's drowning with everything. I mean, yeah. this is just ridiculous. Yeah, we have fires, we have floods, we have all kinds of things going on. Our friend George, he called tonight. They're having a hurricane down there on the Gulf Coast where yeah, he I saw is. That. And he said that the winds are unbelievable. There's tree limbs down everywhere, but luckily he's safe in his new house, and uh, that's a good thing. So yeah, that's it's for sure. uh, that weather for sure. has gotten more more violent. But anyhow, well, with all so, the winds that we've had had here, I've lost uh, part of one of my big trees out front are, are gone. And you'll go down the oh, road no. and you'll see trees that have been uprooted right out of the ground because oh. you know we're not used to this much water. That's right. And it's That's okay. Right. My, my my poor garage is half drowned. <laughs> I tell you. Oh, oh, no. You're underwater. Well, that's not good either. Oh, gee. Well, change is everywhere. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. And last, last week, now last week, I want to mention this because you and I had quite a strange experience on the air. Yes, with we our did. Guests. 
Christy Robinette. She's a psychic medium, and she had a, a little bit of a tag along, we think, because during the show, we kept hearing this very noisy, squeaky chair. And you and I thought it was Christy's chair because we're very mm-hmm. attuned to any extraneous noise in the room. We make sure that we're not the source of it. And so in the break, I said to Christy, can you change your chair out? Because it's really noisy. Every time you move, I hear, we hear these loud squeaks. And then she really shocked me when she said, it, it's not me. She said, I'm sitting in a straight back <laughs> dining room chair. So that's when we knew we had a visitor. And mm-hmm. also, mm-hmm. after the show, we had some phone calls from listeners who said, by the way, we heard demonic voices in the background of the show. And it was mm-hmm. low and gruff and fast. So we had a few phone calls from listeners like that. And then after the show, I took a photograph, as I often do, in the room, because sometimes things show up. And mm-hmm. that devil head showed yes up. definitely a devil's head very clear and i posted it on our facebook page if you haven't seen it mm-hmm. go to our facebook page supernatural girls on facebook take a look it, there is no mistaking what that is and we're glad that it's not here with us tonight uh but it that's did for sure. make an appearance that's for sure make an appearance and made himself known so we did reach out to christy after the show we let her know she should do some clearing And kind of get rid of that thing, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But these kinds of things, it's so fascinating on our show. We're a little different than other shows. We don't just talk about the paranormal. We live it. (laughs) And it happens regularly. (laughs) Yeah, it happens regularly on our show. So anyways, take a look at that, that photo on our Facebook page. And we do have a little bit of very interesting paranormal news tonight. Well, there was... Another sighting of a UFO. Seems like they're everywhere lately. And this one, where was mm-hmm. this one? North Carolina skies that yeah. picked it up. Mm-hmm. And and it was videotaped. Uh, take a look. Again, that is also on our Facebook page. We found it on Mysterious Universe, which is a great source for paranormal news. And so there's that photo and video. And you know what, though, PK? That one looks like one of ours. Well, you know, you said that earlier today, and I, I was looking at it, too, and I have to agree with you. I, I think it's one of our guys playing games with the rest of us. Just to yeah, I think so. I think so. Because we did have a gentleman on the show who talked about some of the uh, the undercover stuff that's going on and, and that we do have our own UFO-type crafts, and they usually mm-hmm. send them out to be tested. What did he tell us, Thursday night? It's their testing right. night. So if you see a UFO mm-hmm. on Thursday night, it's probably one of ours. And I didn't catch which date uh, this one appeared on, but uh, it did look like it could have been one of ours. We'll see. And then the other story that you need to go to our, our web, I mean, our, our Facebook page to see, is mm-hmm. about the little blue men. I mean, this is the cutest yeah, little that story. Yeah, pretty cute. Not, it's adorable. Yeah. And this was written by Brent. Swanser, and he reported about this little blue man that showed up to these children after a lightning strike. And these these kids kept trying to get closer to this little blue man, and it looked like he was wearing a one-piece suit, a tall-brimmed <laughs> bowler-type hat, and a black belt, and he was carrying a black box in the front, and he had some type of a strange blue beard which could have been a breathing apparatus, the writer has well, that's, uh, reminded Well, that's about what I that. noticed. They said, like, the beard split in the front where it could have been the breathing apparatus. And I'm just thinking to myself, a little smurf with a part in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cute as that. So they could never get right next to him because he would always move 20 feet away. But they kept uh-huh. trying to get closer and closer to him. And they went and told their teacher that this is what they saw. Of course, she didn't believe them. But she had them all separately write down their accounts and draw what they saw, and they all said the same thing and drew the same thing. And I tend to believe children who tell these types of stories, that they are giving an accurate account to the best of their ability. And then there was another story of a young girl who also saw the same thing. But here's the kicker. Her mother saw it, and her 
father saw it. So this thing showed up in the parents' bedroom. It showed up looking into her window. The father saw it then, too. So there were quite a few sightings of this little blue man. And who's to say where he came from? It could have been an interdimensional. Um, I doubt that he was extraterrestrial, but he could have been. And who Man, knows? But it was just anymore. an adorable story. Yeah, it could be. And so, anyhow, take a look at that. Also, very interesting story. Um, we love these kinds of stories, and we love to report them to you because they're just so much fun. So tonight, no, I keep losing my papers. I swear to God, there must be somebody in the room with me tonight. They're moving my papers all around. Okay. <laughs> oh, before we go there, I just want to mention numerology this is a good time to review the past year called patricia kirkman patricia kirkman.com you can find her at that website and also on the supernatural girls website and get your numbers done find out what's coming up for you based on your name and your birth date and if you're looking to work with dreams start a dream group you can contact me i'm also on the supernatural girls website just click away and i'll be happy to help you in any way i can So this evening, this is such a fascinating topic we're going to be talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. The messengers, owls, and UFOs. I mean, I am so excited to hear what Mike has to say. There is something so profound about this. And I think we're only going to be able to get to the tip of the iceberg, but I think everybody should go get Mike's books. He's got two books out about this. It's called The Messengers, Owl Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee, and Stories from the Messengers, Accounts of Owls, UFOs, and a Deeper Reality. So let me tell you a little bit about Mike. He is an avid outdoorsman, illustrator, and UFO researcher, and he has written extensively on the subject of alien abductions, synchronicities, and owls. And it was his own firsthand experiences with these elusive events that were the foundation for his research. Now, he spent nearly 25 years living in the beautiful Rockies, and now he lives in the Adirondacks up near us. How about it? So we're going to get him on right away because we have so much to talk about. Mike, welcome to the show. It's my honor. It's a delight. Well, this is a great topic, and we have so many questions for you. But this is a topic that came out of your own personal experience. So tell us what happened to you. Well, so others had touched on this topic before. There's certainly this topic was out there in the literature, um, though I've certainly, I feel like I've taken it a lot further. I mean, so, so in any number of books out there, UFO books, um, there'd be a paragraph here, a half a page there, a few sentences here and there, and they're out. So that's out there. People had recognized this pattern. Um, so it's uh, turn the clock back 12 years. Uh, right around this time, 12 years in the autumn of 2006, I was um, living in uh, near Grand Teton National Park, and I went out camping for one night with a friend, and uh, her name is Kristen, and we we I didn't really know her. You know, it was kind of it was a funny thing. So in that culture, this is a camping culture, and it's an outdoor town. You know, kind of like for a first date, you say, hey, let's go camping. So uh, that's what we did. We went into this beautiful spot in the mountains, and I teach a form of lightweight backpacking. So I was like, we could, we could go with very light backpacks. There was no rain in the forecast. So we went without a shelter, and we simply slept out under the stars. So as the sun was setting, I'm going to add a couple details to this. As the sun was setting, Kristen was talking, and I thought to myself, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't expect this. She was saying something that I felt was really profound. And in that moment, an owl flew over. And then a second owl, and then a third owl, and for the next, I think, like couple of hours, as the sun was setting and the stars came out, we watched these owls fly around. They would land on branches near us. They would swoop down over us, and they were there for the two hours. And when we actually laid down to go to bed, it was it was all dark by then. The sun was fully down. Um, we would lay on our backs and look up at the stars. Now, this is at like 10,000 feet in the northern Rockies. The stars are mind-blowing. And, and as you're looking up into the big purple sky there, the, this, the stars would be blotted out for just one second as, an owls, as these owls would fly past our faces very low. Now, owls are very quiet. There was nothing to hear. So it was, um, it was so remarkable. 
a few days later, so we, so we left the mountains the next morning. I was like, hey, that was really cool. And then a few days later, we go in a different part of the mountains. And um, this is a totally different camping trip. We were only camping for one night. We did it again, I think, four days later. And uh, it was setting. And I said, let's go hike up to the top of that hill just to get a view of the sunset. So we did. We walked up. We got up there. The sun is setting. And an owl lands on a branch right near oh my us. And a second owl swoops above us. And then a third owl lands at our feet. And they were close the first time. But this was remarkable. This was unbelievable. They were so close. They were landing on the ground right in front of us. And I'm convinced they're the same three owls. I mean, there's no way to prove that, but that's my gut sense. That these are the same three owls. We were in a different part, many miles away from where we had been camping before. Now, what I didn't say then, uh, but I knew it, and what I'm saying now that the book is out and it's part of my story is while I was looking at these owls, now these were real owls, I had a voice in my head that said, this has something to do with the UFOs. Mm. And, mm. and at that point in my life, I, was, I, was, um, I had a handful of life experiences that sure implied UFO contact. And I, did, I wasn't going to go there. I didn't, I didn't want to deal with them. I didn't want to look into them. And after those owl sightings, I did look into them. And, I, and, I, and the course of my life has changed. I'm now doing this full time. It's it's a lousy way to make a living, but an amazing way <laughs> to to uh, to sort of connect with mixed people. emotions. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. So yeah. But I mean, I, I just feel like I'm 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 I don't want to say obligated, but it's a very it's a really powerful experience for me. Now, so uh, that was in 2006. So Kristen left town shortly thereafter. She moved away. Um, she was only working there for a summer job, and then I started a blog in 2009 and the very first story I put on the blog was the story I just told about those owls. And after I posted it in 2009, I got a hold of Kristen and I said, what were we talking about? I remember you were talking about something very profound and it made an impact on me. On me. What were we talking about the very first night when we saw those very first owls? And without skipping a beat, she said, oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about. I was giving my deepest, most heartfelt definition of what God means to me. Hmm. Now that took this already kind of mystical experience and it sort of pushed me off the cliff. And I say this to people, this is a funny way to introduce myself, but I say this to people and I mean it. And it's true between about 2006, beginning with these owl things into about 2011, 2012, I bet you I spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane. I was having wow. so many the synchronicities were coming so fast and furious. I was seeing so many owls. If I had a synchronicity, some powerful coincidence, a meaningful coincidence, if I pulled on those threads, they were somehow connected to owls or UFOs. And I, mm. so this is when I really started writing about it and trying to make sense of it. And I was doing it in a very public way, which is kind of nutty when you think about it. I was putting it all online immediately. <laughs> so. Very brave thing to do, Mike. Good for you. Brave. I don't know. Brave. Them, but I think maybe like foolhardy might be a better term. So, but. <laughs> so here was the beginning of a great exploration with owls and UFOs and abductees. Well, the, and yeah, there's no UFOs people, in the story. Yeah. No, not yet. So that came later because you said you had to look at your own experiences, right? And you did well, have some type of alien experience. Well, I had, so in my youth, um, I, when I was about 12 years old, I saw a, what felt like a close-up craft outside a window. A friend of mine saw it too. I made a drawing that night, which I still have. Um, and that would have been in 1974. I'm 56 now, and I would have been about 12 at that point. Um, also in 1974, I... Um, was walking home from a high school football game with a friend and we both saw like what I felt was like a weird flash in the sky, like a weird, like the sky lit up orange and then click turned off again. And then when I got home, my parents were angry at me and I knew exactly what time it was. I wanted to be home in time to see a television show called Cole Shack, the night stalker, which started at 10 o'clock. And I was going to, and that <laughs> oh, was yes, and, one of my favorites. <laughs> yes, yes. So, Great show. Um, 10 o'clock on channel. 7. Great show. And um, so I, uh, and I was probably home around 9.30, but it wasn't 9.30, it was 
So it was about an wow. hour and a half late. Missing I don't know exactly. Two hours in, between an hour and a half of two hours of missing time. It's possible to. It's impossible now to really come up with a good answer. How many? How you know would have been? Um, but uh, and then uh, now that was when I was twelve. Now fifteen or so years later, I was thirty, and I was in living in rural Maine. And I in the winter, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and there was a bright light shining through the window. And I sat up in bed, and I looked out the window, and there were uh, five spindly gray aliens with big bald heads and big black eyes walking towards the house, and they were backlit by this bright light. And I was as calm as calm can be. I don't understand it. I should have freaked out. It felt like everything, like like all emotion, all sensation was like sucked out of the atmosphere around me. Like it wasn't just me that was calm. Everything was calm. You know, the air was calm. Mm. Um, my vision was calm. I, it's a weird sensation. It was dreamlike. But at this point, I don't think it was a dream. So I heard a voice in my head that says, that said, oh, yes, they're here. Now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I went right to sleep. Click. I was out. And then... Um, the next morning, I never even bothered to look and see if there were footprints in the snow. Oh, so my was, goodness. That was, that was in my background be- well before the Alps. Um, <clears throat> so I was, um, I felt like I was primed a little bit to, you know, that was yeah. that was what was simmering under the surface, those memories. Like, I could tell all those stories. I could sit around a dinner table or a campfire and just say, hey, I got a funny story for you and share those stories just like I did now. And I wouldn't have taken the next step, like. What does that mean? What does that imply? I wasn't going to go there. I had a curious experience, and I knew that much, but I wasn't going to go the next step until the Alps, when I started looking into my own experiences in 2006. So the Owls have led you further down this path, and did you ever undergo hypnosis or anything to retrieve memories from those two events? Well, there's been more than those since then, yeah. So I have attempted hypnosis a few times, and and actually quite recently, uh, just a week ago, I attempted hypnosis. I'm not really ready to talk about that yet because it's the the, the the you know the experiences are a little like I don't trust them what what emerged. So, uh, but what I can I can share a few things. Um, okay. But yeah, so very little emerged from the hypnosis sessions. Um, one thing that emerged was a very strong sense of knowing when when I was Bud Hopkins going back to 2008, hypnotized me about the event in 1993 where I was looking out the window in Maine where the five beings were. He, he asked me, like, you know, what do you sense? What are you feeling? What? And I was just very palpable, which is a feeling that I knew, but I, almost, I was almost too embarrassed to say it. And under hypnosis, I could say it, is that, like, I recognize them. They're back. It's them. Like, I, it was as plain as plain can be in my memory under hypnosis that I had these were not strangers, these beings that I'd seen them many times. Now, also, in just looking at this whole phenomenon, we often see an intergenerational component. Was this also true for you? Did this happen to parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anything like that? You know, not that I know of. I have no, I have no, I've thought about that and I've asked around a little bit, nothing. So. I'm from the Midwest. Nothing as I remember. Stuff, so, yeah. <laughs> they don't. You're right. You're right. Well, you've had quite an interesting experience uh, on and off, and you said you've had several more. That this, These two you mentioned are just two of many that you've had with extraterrestrials. It's funny. Sometimes I'll sit with people, and like people who like research this stuff and people who are like, you know, I sat with this woman from Sedona for a while, and and we just went on and oh, and there's this one more story. There's this one more story. And she's like, you know, she's like a groovy Sedona, you know, healer and, and starseed <laughs> and the whole thing, you know. So she was like, she, even she was like, holy crap, this is, it just goes on and on. I'm like, yeah, yeah I guess it kind of does, you know. So, um, but, you know, it's funny. I mean, that's obviously like, it, you know, if I had to figure out how much of my waking life was taken up by these experiences, it would be like a very, very small percentage, obviously. But, um, but it has a, it, it steered the direction of my life, you know. It pushed me off the 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 the, the road, you know. It sure did. Normal. It took you right down the rabbit hole. Now, one yeah. of the things I found fascinating in in one of your presentations was when you looked at people's names that had owl experiences, and they had owl in their name. 
What in the yeah, world? Yeah, people have a whole other name. I'm, I'm very, I'm very, you know. So a little bit of that is, you know, that's a little bit more of an insight into the quirky workings of my mind. But I know two people, <laughs> Christina mm-hmm. Knowles and Christopher Knowles. So Chris Knowles and Chris Knowles. And they were both living yeah. in Boston at the time. One of them has moved. They both moved, but they're both from Boston. Um, so Chris Knowles and Chris Knowles. One of them is a UFO researcher, Christina Knowles. And one of them, good grief, I don't even know how to articulate what this guy does. He's one of the most insightful writers and speakers on this subject. And he goes way out there as far as the way he tries to frame this stuff. So, And, the, and if you look at Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-S, it has owl right in the middle. Um, That's right. And, uh, and, you know, so, so in another one that I, I, again, this is more the quirky workings of my mind rather than, you know, don't nobody start a new religion over this one. But um, so <laughs> owls are, 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 owls are mythology, you know, they're, they're embedded into our mythology. So ancient mythology has owls as the messengers. They, they're messengers. They, they can see into the darkness. They can fly into other realms. They can fly into the land of the dead, to the land of the ancestors, to the land of the gods. And, and they, and that's, flying at night, right? So any ancient man would have seen the owls fly at night. That All over the world, that turned into flying into the other realm in all the world's traditions, mythic traditions. Now, they have to return with a message. I mean, that's the next logical interpretation. So the owl doesn't just fly off. He comes back with a message. So, I mean, I got a message from those owls. I saw them in the mountains with Kristen. I heard very clearly both times this has something to do with UFOs. It was a message. Now, um, that's the ancient mythology, right? So that's going back to the Greeks and the, the Babylonians yes. and stuff like that. Now, present day mythology, right? So Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It's perfect. It's a messenger. It couldn't be more straightforward. It's as plain as plain can be. It has an owl that delivers the mail. J.K. Rowling as owl right in her name. Right in her name. Wow, we that is just so that, again, incredible. Yeah, this is a little this is this is don't nobody go out there and start a new religion over this one. But um, <laughs> uh, but it's the kind of stuff I pay attention to. Those little threads. I I take note. Yeah, and it makes sense too. I mean maybe there's an owl tribe and having it show up in your name like that makes you a part of it. It's fascinating. It's just fascinating well, it's what you've uncovered name. here. Yeah, but it's not in your name. How strange is that? I don't, well, I mean, it's all strange. So, I mean, how, yeah, I, I've given up on trying to categorize how, you know, how strange is strange. Some of the most – so, yeah, so my story at the beginning, right? So those owls in the mountains. There's really not that much – that's not much of a story when you get right down to it. A guy goes camping with a friend. They see some owls. They go camping again. They see some more owls. The end. Right. But <laughs> it changed the direction of my life. It sure did. It sure did. Well, these are powerful creatures, and to be able to go back and forth between one dimension and another is is astounding. And so, what you said well, that their really whole can. purpose that, is to deliver a message. Well, I, I like mythology. I think that there may be a grain of truth in this. So, but there's so many different interpretations of owls. I've heard Native Americans talk about owls being also uh, deception. So it's and we, in our culture, talk about the wisdom of the owl, the wise owl. There's just a lot of very different perceptions mm-hmm. of the owl. Uh, I told Patricia yeah. that I had not seen an owl close up until a couple of weeks ago. And then I have one huge one that flew out of the tree, and I was stunned at how wide the wingspan was. And it keeps coming back now, and it sits on one of the shelvings of the uh, it's like a motorhome carport type thing. And he sits on the rail there periodically, and then he'll take off. And as long as nobody disturbs him, he'll sit there for ages. And my granddaughter went absolutely crazy about seeing him and wanted to get close, but he just took off. But she was stunned when she saw the wingspan on him, as I was. There. Now, what you're, yeah, so here are a couple questions. So you said a couple <laughs> weeks ago, when did we have our first, when did you contact me to say you wanted to do this? A couple weeks know, ago. I'm not going to open my computer. A couple weeks ago. Yeah, a couple isn't weeks that ago. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so so now also, um, uh, um, so owls have huge wings. Owls fly very quietly. And the way mm-hmm. they achieve their silent flight is because they have very big wings, and they actually fly very slowly. 
right? So a, a falcon catches the mouse by flying incredibly mm-hmm. fast. If you look at a falcon's wings, they, they look like little fighter pilot wings. They're very short right. and stubby. <laughs> and, and, a, and an owl's wings. Looks um, like a van dancer. <laughs> it, they are huge. They're long. Even take a little teen yeah. owl. There's a, something called a saw wet owl. It's about four inches tall. When they open their wings, it's like, whoa, it doesn't make any sense. It looks like a yeah. special effect or something like that, you know, like on a cartoon. And, um, and they, but so owls have very large wings. And the reason they have those is, it's, a, it's part of their, their stealth technology. They have big wings to fly slow so they, they don't produce any noise when they fly. There's a bunch of other stuff going yeah. on with their feathers and such. But yeah. I, I was stunned at, at how huge the wings were. I, I was mesmerized Everyone by is. the size. Everyone is, yeah. I've heard yeah, it. I've seen amazing. owls and a lot of owls, and eye blows me away every time. It's like they unfold yeah. these things out of, like, it's magic. Like, whoa, 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 they keep on coming out. You know, when, <laughs> and you see a robin on the tree, like, flap its wings. They ain't, that ain't very impressive, but an owl is something else altogether. Yeah. That is. Well, we're going to take a very short commercial break, and then we are going to continue this fascinating discussion about owls, UFOs, abductees, the messengers, a new book with Mike Clellan. Well, actually, it's two books, and you should get both of them because they're great. In pieces of information, and they have read. real accounts, real accounts of what's happened. So, stay tuned, everybody. You're listening to Supernatural Girls Radio, and we will be right back. Are you ready for a new experience of freedom and powerful connection? Would you like a positive, effortless change in your life? Then come to CosmicFusion.com, where we offer the most advanced energy clearing and expansion techniques in the world with a quantum vortex energy to activate your divine blueprint and life's purpose. When your soul leads the way with cosmic fusion and quantum vortex energy, you can break clear of past difficulties and blocks with the power of the source. With cosmic fusion, the source energy does the work for you. It's easy and effortless. Listen to our free meditation right from our Cosmic Fusion website, the Cosmic Code Meditation. Sign up for one of our interactive webinars today. Come to Cosmic Fusion, www.kosmicfusion.com to experience an effortless awakening and transformation. Are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready for a new experience of living in the fifth dimensional magic and powerful connection? Then visit CosmicFusion.com today. CosmicFusion.com Astridian is a family of cosmetic products with 98% pure ionized minerals. We combine our science with a blend of essential oils to nourish and take care of your skin's health. How does it work? All Astridian products contain the proprietary redox technology having the capability of simulating an ionic zinc-copper superoxide dismutas effect. This free radical scavenger currently in your body has been diminished by toxins and the daily stresses of life. It is a perfectly balanced mineral complex that all $200 an hour dermatologists, their professors, and ancient history have proven. Redox technology is a process of reducing the skin's oxidation by transferring electrons from a radical state to a stress-free normal condition. Oxidative stress is a form of cellular aging, and as science has proven, a precursor to disease. The free radical theory of aging states that organisms age because cells accumulate free radical damage over time. Damaged cells are not beautiful, but healthy cells are. The Astridium family is presented in four different uses that cover unique benefits to your body. They are the Essential Anti-Aging Series, the Multivitamin Series, Sports Series, and Professional Series. Regain your youth with the power of Astridian. Visit www.astridian.com and inquire. Use the code SUPERNATURAL and receive a 10% discount on your first purchase. Astridian, the beauty of being healthy. Your property tax bill. Have you seen it lately? It's frightening. Your property taxes are going up while your home value is going down. It's time to fight back and win. For the real truth about the property tax system, get Attorney Pat Quintilian's book, Are You Getting Screwed on Your Property Taxes? How to Find Out and How to Fix It. Attorney Quintilian answers all your questions and gives you the facts you need to fight a property tax bill that is spiraling out of control. You'll also read about what happens to property owners who don't check their property records 
only to find out too late they're taxed on square footage, fixtures, and even buildings that they don't own. Is this happening to you? Learn your rights. Buy attorney Pat Quintilian's book today. Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Available on Amazon.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with my co-host, PK, and our terrific guest tonight, fascinating, Mike Leland. And he is the author of two books. They're both excellent. The Messengers, Owl Synchronicity and the UFO Abductee, and Stories from the Messengers, Accounts of Owls, UFOs, and a Deeper Reality. So let's see, Mike, where do we go from here? You've got so many wonderful stories to share about people that have seen owls. And one of them in particular I'd love for you to share with our audience, which is the one about the person who saw the owl and just and it was really an E. T. And he and I forget if it was a man or woman kept hearing in their mind Owl, 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 owl. Please tell oh, that yeah. story. That's fascinating. So um <laughs> Uh, this is a woman. Her pen name is Lucretia Hart, and she has a, a website called At Spirals End, and it's worth looking at this website. It's an amazing website. Um, she was, she's, when she was 19 years old, she was working in a summer camp for girls. Now, she had already had a lot of experiences at that point, and she, they always happened at night. So, when, and she knew it was like these contact experiences. She was aware of it, but she was working at the summer camp, and and she was walking like basically between two buildings, right? So it's in a forest and there's some buildings and there's a path to the next set of buildings. And she leaves one set of buildings. She's walking through the forest. And there's a little clearing there. And she can hear the girls like playing in the background, right? So that she's not far. She's not deep in the woods or anything. And she turns this corner in the, in the trail and, and there's a gray alien standing right at the edge of the trail. And she looks at it and it looks at her and she hears this, this reverberating echo in her mind like this. I mean, you know, so these, beings by all accounts have this sort of mind control and she startles it and it looks at her she looks at it and she hears this voice go owl 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 <laughs> and she watches it turn into That's an owl hilarious. oh for him and it and it then it turns and runs into the woods now yeah so that that now what that falls into is less the real owls and that's a that's what's referred to in the in the ufo literature as a screen memory. And the implication is that, you know, well, she saw it in her story, you know, implies that this, like that the, the gray alien didn't turn into an owl. It's her perception that it, it Im- influenced her mind to think she was seeing an owl, right? She saw a four foot tall owl turn and run into the woods. Now what's very common is someone will say like, Oh, I'm, you know, like I was driving home at night and I had a, big owl on the road and it sure was weird. And then when I, when I, and it was about four feet tall and I got home and golly, it was, you know, two hours later than I thought it should have been. And then one day I get hypnotically regressed and, and which is, a, which is his own messy thing, right? There's no clear answers as to if that's, if you're getting true memories retrieved. Um, but under hypnosis, you know, the, the hypnotherapist will ask, you know, what does the owl look like? And the, and the observer will say, well, got a big bald head and these big black eyes and it's wearing a tight fitting space suit and it's got long skinny <laughs> fingers and I don't think I was looking at an owl. So the implication <laughs> is that there's some sort of psychic projection that's influencing the mind of the observer to think they are seeing an owl. Now it's not just owls. There's plenty of other stuff too. There's uh, uh, deer. You know, so on top of the list is probably owls. Very close second is deer. And then below that, there's all kinds of other things, squirrels, firemen, Jesus actually shows up a lot, dead relatives, um, raccoons, cats. So is it possible, Mike, I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but what do you think? Is this what they're doing? They're trying to influence us so that we don't see them, but we see something else that we're familiar with instead? In those screen memory experiences yeah i mean so people are seeing four foot tall owls i get that all the time like i was driving down and i pulled right up to this owl and it was staring at me over the hood of my car i pulled right up to it it just stood there and let me tell you i don't even take the smallest car in the world and take the biggest owl in the world and they that owl ain't going to be able to look over the hood of the car so um oh yeah good so yeah so that (laughs) yeah so there's but what i'm 
you know, at this point, what I'm much more interested in is the real owls. People are seeing real owls. I got people take pictures, you know, like, oh, this is what's, here's what's really common. This is what's very common. I've, you know, like I'm going to do a lot of kind of, you know, research. I'll talk to someone on the phone or I'll show up at their house. And here's one story. This guy, Ron, and living in Utah, they showed up at his house and he had all kinds of experiences, some with owls. So he had, a, he, so he had one experience with an owl, right? He gets up in the middle of the night. He's impelled to walk to his porch. He walks to his porch. He looks out and there's a four foot tall owl standing in the yard looking at him. Hmm. And I said, was it a dream? And I don't think it was a, yeah, I don't think it was a dream. And that, and and because I could feel the cement, the cold cement of the porch under my bare feet. I don't think that was a dream. So that's, and then he also, after I left, like I'm driving away, it's in nighttime and such, and he gets back to me. And he says, oh, just after you left, an owl flew in the garage, and he took a picture of it. And it's a real owl. It's a little owl, a little, you know, great horned owl, a little compared to four feet tall. So yeah, so this is what I'm much more interested in. Is the, the 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 owls showing up at, at what I refer to as highly charged moment? Real owls showing up at highly charged moments, um, and I know some UFO researchers who will have none of that. They don't want it. No way. No way. The owls aren't part of it. They're owls. There's certainly screen memories where people think they're seeing an owl, and um, but I, my sense is that people are having experiences with real owls, and that's the side of the equation that really floats my boat. I get fascinated by it. So you prefer that? Well, here's an here's an example of of something where I don't have an answer to this one. Uh, I was driving in the south, and with my husband at the time, and we were going onto a ramp to the highway. And as we were coming up to the ramp, and then we were on the ramp, all of a sudden there is an owl just standing there. Now, it just, oh, that no, memory me. has, the, go ahead. Was it in the middle of the road or at the edge of the road? Yes, it was in the middle of the road, not by the side. It was right in the middle of the ramp. And uh, it was startling. I mean, I was startled by it. And I, when I think back on it, it is such a clear memory of seeing the owl. What I don't remember is the owl flying away. And that's what I think is odd. Because if you come upon an owl in the road, you would think that the headlights and the the noise of the car would send it into flight. It wouldn't just stand there. But that's all I remember. So was that a real owl or was it something else? That's something I, I think about often. So here's my question. What was going on in your life leading up to that event? I have two questions. We were on vacation and we were driving back uh, to our okay, home. You weren't talking about anything. So it, you don't remember the conversation. Or? I don't remember the conversation, and I just remember the owl in the headlights and thinking, "Why is an owl standing there in the middle of the road?" Now it wasn't four feet tall; it was about the size you would think an owl would be. So, but I just don't. But the, again, the interesting piece. To me, is it didn't. I don't remember it flying away. I just remember seeing it and being completely startled by it. And what do you do for? What are you doing now? And what am I I'm, doing I'm, now? I'm, I know the answer here. So what are you doing right now? You, what am I doing right now? You're hosting, I'm, you're hosting a paranormal show. I'm you're hosting, hosting a hosting paranormal show talking world. about owls with an expert, Mike Cleland. Yeah. <laughs> no. no, I'm just saying that. So yes, who, who knows? Maybe they it zapped you and said you're going to start a podcast someday. You know, who knows? They very well. Could be. I, I don't know that's of... true. I'm making that up, but but yeah. But you know what I'm saying? It's like it, it, there are some some odd pieces to it. Maybe nothing. It may be there may be something more. And in fact, I was talking to friends of mine, Betty and and Bob, Andreas and Luca about going under hypnosis with maybe David Jacobs or somebody like that who's a very good hypnotist and, and seeing what I could pull up. And again, it may be nothing, but that's, I think, an interesting point. How many people have had experiences that may be paranormal, but they just take them, you know, for granted that it's just, oh, it was just an owl. I just saw an owl. They may not even uh, realize that, it, that they've had an experience I, I just beyond that. I, I agree. I think the numbers would be, I, I mean, I'm getting presently, I'm getting, I used to, like a, a couple of years ago, I was getting, you know, almost one a day. 
a good owl story. You know, wow. that was less than that. So by the end of the year, it was probably 300 good owl stories I was getting. And that went on for years. Now, I'm getting about five a day. And I am flooded. Five a day? They're all really? remarkable. Five a day. Yeah, owl, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about people saying, I mean, these are like paranormal owl stories, sometimes involving UFOs, sometimes involving others, some highly charged experience. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, you know, I can't keep up. So you just said a question, you know, like maybe, you know, what's going on? Are people, do people have these buried memories? What's going on? And my sense is there is a lot going on under the, under the waterline here. Um, you know, in, in the grand human experience, I think there's a lot of weird stuff going on that people are just barely even capable of wrapping their mind around. So, and then I'm at the receiving end of a lot of these stories and I'm, and I feel very honored to be, archiving and collecting and trying to make sense of these stories. Yeah, you're the keeper of this information and the wisdom that comes with it. It it just feels, it's always felt to me, and PK and I were talking about this before the show, that we have yet to really grasp the true meaning of the owl. What do you think about that? Well, Are we that's, missing that's, some is, pieces is, here? So there's a term, so so I hear this, is good. so we, to tell any story correctly, I have to like, okay, we have to back up, I have to tell three things before, I have to like, all these threads connect, <laughs> so any story I tell is like, oh my God, it's, just, you're, it's like the can of worms just is running all over the place. So I, for the first book, I interviewed a woman named Jacqueline Smith, and she is a channeler. She's, a, she's an animal communicator. She also channeled this big, beautiful book called, I think it's called Spirit Animals, or I think that's what the title of it. And, and she, you know, channeled a dolphin and a butterfly and a, and a dog. And, and uh, you know, so this is, but she also channeled an owl. And I read that part of the book and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. You know, this is pretty good stuff. And she was very clear. She wasn't channeling an owl. She was channeling the spirit of an owl, like the collective mm-hmm. spirit of an owl. This is pretty grand stuff. So she was walking on this path every day. She saw this owl. And finally, one day she said, do you have anything to tell me? Basically, do you have a message in this dialogue in her mind? Under, and she wrote it all down. So I contacted her by phone because I was like, I got to hear about this. And, she, and I first thing I asked her, so what are you doing these days? And she said, I'm working on my third book. And it's like, oh, what's your third book about? And it's like, well, it's about my UFO abduction experiences, my UFO contact uh, experiences. Oh, like, okay, so there's one more. The one uh, uh-huh. like every person I talk to is like, well, what are you up to? I'm like, well, I'm writing a book or I'm, I'm a, you know, I just, I, the number of people who have this UFO contact thing that sort of emerge in my life is bizarre. So anyway, I'm talking with, with her and I, I'm so glad I recorded this conversation and I, <laughs> God, you know, she explained how she was channeling the owl and everything like that. And I said, Hey, 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 hey listen, if you see that owl again, you ask for me because I want to know what is going on with all these owls. What is up with the yeah. owls and the UFOs? And she was talking for a little bit, and then all of a sudden her voice got a little halting, and it changed, and she was speaking quieter. And I was like, holy, she's channeling. She's channeling right now, and I'm recording it. And she said, she said, I don't have the quote in front of me. I'm doing it uh, just from memory. She said, humans see in archetypes. We see symbols. We see archetypal symbols. Within our human genetic memory bank, within our DNA, is stored a deeper meaning for symbolic things. The owl, the the meaning of the owl is stored in our memory bank. It's an archetype. And it was was like, I actually wrote it down, and and so I didn't do it very good here, but it was about the best two-sentence definition anyone could give for an archetype. And I mean, that's tough. Like you take a philosophy student at Harvard and say, give me two, two sentences. Give me the definition of an archetype. And I, I don't think you're going to top her definition of it. So, so an archetype is this thing that, you know, like a hand, or a, um, Luke Skywalker is the archetype of the hero, right? And, and that the Star Wars was based on the writings of Joseph Campbell. The term archetype comes from Plato, um, he said it was that, that we have a, a, a pure knowing about a thing, right? So a chair, there's a pure knowing of what a chair is. Carl Jung took it further. He said that there is a collective unconscious, like a, like a hive mind where we all share the same internal knowing 
That's what she said. She said it's embedded in our DNA. We have an internal knowing of the archetypal meaning of an owl. Now, it's a slippery slope to go the next step and actually say what that archetypal meaning is. But I'll, I can say is that when she said that, every puzzle piece in the mystery clicked together for me. It was like, oh, it's like I was struggling with an answer to why owls click. It's an archetype. It, everything matched up. So, so you asked the question, you know, what does it mean? What is the deeper meaning of owl? It's a, this is a tough way to say it. It's an archetype. But an archetype of what? What's the deeper yeah, meaning of that that's individual my question. archetype? An archetype of what? Well, this is where – so my, my sense after having done all this, owls show up at initiation events. If, you are, if you're a shaman and you're being initiated, owls sh- will show up, not 100%, but owls show up during shamanic initiation. And there's other things that are, that are shaman-like where owls show up. So owls show up at initiations. Owls show up um, – I, I, I've been saying owls are an alarm clock, right? They are saying, wake up. That's what they did to me. I spent the next six years thinking I'd gone insane. That was the wake-up process, right? So I, they were, that was <laughs> I think so many owls. Was I being initiated into something? I'm doing something totally different now. You know, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm a shaman, but I do feel like I'm doing something that's been helping people, um, which is the role of the shaman. Now, so the deeper meaning of the owl in the second book, what emerged was, which is so weird. I did not expect this. And, and I'm at the point now when I talk to people on the phone, I just get the pen out and I just write Reiki right on the piece of paper, you know, when we're talking on the phone. So explain your owl experience. And then a little boy is down and think, what do you do for, what are you doing for work? Oh, I'm a Reiki therapist. So normal. <laughs> it is so, it's not a hundred percent, but it's like, it's, it's bizarre. Now, um, uh, so owls are somehow associated with healing. In, in this archetypal mythic context, owls are somehow associated with, with a deep challenge, right? So this is not a light and fluffy totem, right? So we, hummingbirds are a light and fluffy totem. Bunny rabbits are light and fluffy totems, right? So you have a bunny rabbit experience. You have a, you have a hummingbird experience. There's a few other animals, um, dragonflies and stuff too. These are, these are light experiences. Owls are heavy, right. heavy, heavy, heavy. doesn't make it bad but you are going to be confronted with challenge. I saw those owls in the mountains of Wyoming in 2006. My life became very challenging. I have a very difficult job in a way now is to, to make sense of this stuff. So it doesn't make it a bad job, but it's, it's very challenging. But the archetype is still not defined. It's like we're still kind of sitting here wondering, well, what is it? I mean, is it an archetype well, <laughs> that... You know that that combines, know, I'm, I'm been doing you know, the life and yeah. death, or is it the right and left hemispheres of the brain? I mean, what is that? And maybe maybe it's that. I mean, it's as you know, ancient Egypt had a lot of symbolism that addressed both sides of the brain: the pineal gland, the sacred eye. And is the owl a part of that? That's the first thing that comes to me as you're discussing these things with our audience. I agree. I agree. I've been, I've been, I mean, this has been, so that's 12 years I've been wrestling with this and I don't have an answer. I can dance around to me and some, <laughs> but I, but I would be, I would be making it up if I, I would be lying if I said I had an answer, but yeah, so the, it's an archetype, but an archetype of what, you know, that's, that's right. the, the, the mystery. That's what we, yeah, I mean, what, and maybe it's that. What's it's the, the hero? Archetype you know, of what's the, yeah. I mean, it could be as simple as that. It's the archetype of mystery, that that's what the owl is about, is about bringing these mysteries to light. I mean, it certainly did that for you. And, you know, bringing the, the mystery of UFOs and ETs to light. I, I mean, it's it's just a fascinating topic that you're so involved with. And we're so glad that you're here with us tonight to discuss all this exciting stuff. But for people that have had UFO abductions and have thought that they've seen owls and then determined it wasn't an owl. What happens for them? I mean, how do they come to terms with this? Oh, with that, you're, you're asking a very good question. So some people don't come to terms with it. Some people, some people deal with it very poorly. Suicides, alcohol, drugs, there's all kinds of, they, I mean, depression, right? So that's a very common. If you've had UFO contact experiences, I've talked to a lot of therapists. I've had a history of clinical depression. Um, 
You know, this is very common with people who have had the contact experience. So, you know, the, the, you're, you are confronted with the deepest challenge. I'll say it. You're confronted with one of the deepest challenges of the human experience. You are, you are confronted. If, you're, if you come to, if all of a sudden you, you have that confirmation event, like I am a UFO abductee. I am a UFO contactee. I mean, I've, you know, I know a lot of folks are, are shy about using the term abductee. If you have that experience, you are, um, you're confronted with a challenge and it's very difficult. Some people rise above it and, and then sh- thrive and shine. And sadly, some don't. Um, and I don't have a recipe or an answer to, you know, what separates those, those two camps. Um, you know, there's these beautiful, radiant, transcendent people that have, and I'll call Whitley Strieber one of them. I mean, I think he's really, he's really stepped up to the plate and looked at this mystery in the deepest possible way. And other people have suffered terribly from these same mm-hmm. things. So, right, you know, society says it's impossible, right? The New York Times, well, actually, they're a little, <laughs> they've loosened their grip on that side of things yeah. since last December. Thank God. But, but uh, so, yeah, so the consensus reality, let's call it consensus reality, says, uh-uh can't happen it's impossible but it happens and once it happens to you so everyone in the everyone not everyone yeah. but consensus reality says it's impossible your direct experience contradicts that mhm yeah and and this you know i think because our whole concept of reality is is shifting and changing and we have so many shows like ours that talk about all of these paranormal events i mean our tagline is supernatural girls where paranormal is normal i mean this these conversations mm-hmm. need to happen. I've said this for years, that people need to have these types of conversations. They are normal, and we need to find ways to integrate these experiences with our daily life so that it's not something separate, not something spooky or scary. It's just a part of our natural life. And Correct, it's, yeah. And it's great that you're doing this work, Mike. I think it's much needed and Again, it's a fascinating topic. This again, this whole thing about looking at an owl face, and I, I picked a couple of them out on the internet and posted them. And right next to an ET face, they do look identical. I mean, the ET doesn't have the they're feathers, very similar, but yes, yes. So that would very be similar. that would be the that would be what the UFO abduction researcher would say. They say, yeah, they're choosing the owl simply because the owl looks similar to to the gray alien they may you know a deer has big black eyes right and and cats have big nocturnal eyes so these are the things that show up in in this but you know it's um whenever anyone says um, whenever anyone repeats something it becomes dogma right and whenever so i'm cautious right so like it that may be exactly the correct reason why the screen memories are choosing owls most of the time but mm-hmm. i I I think it might be they're choosing it for an archetypal reason. They know that it's connected to this ancient core of our human mythology. It's imbued into our DNA. And and we know it in some deeper level that's hard to articulate, but we know it when we see it at a deep level. It makes sense to me because certainly there are symbols and archetypes that transcend our consciousness, our puny little consciousness, and brings us into a larger space. And the owl is certainly one of those larger-than-life archetypes that can make that kind of a profound difference. Again, but I feel like, as I'm sure you do, and I know, PK, you do too, there is so much more to the owl than we know at this point. Just so much more to this. Well, I know, I'm surprised that I lived in Greece. Been... Oh, go on. I was going to say, when I lived in Greece, it was thought that if an owl entered the house, that it was extremely bad luck. Having them outside was fine. But if, if they entered the house, there would be a problem. And while it, we lived there, yeah. a, a Navy lieutenant commander, their house, an owl flew in. And the next day, he fell off the edge of the pool trying to take care of it and injured himself was hospitalized and almost had to be medevaced back to the States. Mm. Wow. That was an omen. Well, I know a lot of people who have had owls in their house, and, and nothing bad mm-hmm. has happened to them. 
So oh, that's and, good. I, and I'm convinced <laughs> that this lore well, that's, that's good to know. Is, but like I said, that, that was local. one of the things that they talked about in Greece. Oh, just keep the owls. And I never saw an owl up until a couple of weeks ago. I've, you know, see pictures when, of them whenever. When we started not, exchanging not emails. Yeah. Wow. Well. Mm-hmm. Well, they are so connected because here two weeks ago we contacted you and suddenly PK mm-hmm. is seeing an owl for the first time in her area in Tucson. And last night we have barred owls here and they love to talk to one another, as I'm sure you know. And last yeah, I heard night last they night too. Yeah, they are having a heck of a conversation. And it's it's great to be able to hear them and they can make some really interesting noises. Sometimes they sound like wild monkeys too. And when I first moved here, I thought I was in Africa because that's exactly what it sounded like. They had seen a white dog I had, and it just drove them insane. They were, they were just ecstatic about this white animal because they could see it easily, and they were thinking, oh, good, here's something to eat. Thank God they didn't get them. But, <laughs> it, you know, they're, they're just so, that's again, there's so, many, yeah, there's so many aspects. To these owls, but I was able to learn how to make that same sound, and so I can go outside at night and call to them, and they will call back. So, oh, they're again, very simple like that, yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's just it's fascinating, and again, I just think that there's there's a lot. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg with owls. There's so much to it, and I'm hoping that you're going to get to the bottom of this, Mike. I really hope you will, because we want to know. Well, that's not my goal. I, Very I'd interesting. I think if, I, if that was my goal to get to the bottom of it, I think I'd, I'd go crazy because I would. I've, I've. What I've had to do is like loosen up my, my, my requirements or my needs. You know, I had. I, I, I. Yes, I was struggling desperately, and there came a point. Here's a funny story. I was you know, doing the research. I would get a. I have a, um, an iPad, right? So I'd get the books on Kindle, and I'd get a digital version of a book. Right? I'm sitting at home. I'm like someone who says, hey, there's an owl reference in this book. For instance, in, in I could read it aloud here. I, I'm not going to open up my computer. I'll do it, paraphrase it. In um, Kurt Vonnegut's fictional book, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, where Billy Pilgrim goes to Trafalgar, or whatever the name of the planet is, and he's taken by the Trafalgarians on, on their flying saucer, and he has all these time slip things. So there's all these key things that are part of the present-day UFO lore, like mixed up time and so he leaves his house knowing what's going to happen. He walks out into the yard and he hears, a, hears an, an owl. But it's not an owl. He thinks it's an owl, but it's a UFO. And, and the oh. UFO comes down and it, and it, it lands. Uh, it takes him, you know, it abducts him. So here it is, 1969, long before Whitley Strieber's communion, there's an owl UFO connection in fiction. So where did that come from? That I would argue that's an archetype, and it, mm-hmm. and it emerged yeah. out of the creative process from from Kurt Vonnegut's mind. Oh, so I look back to the thing. So I had a uh, uh, an iPad, right? So I'm doing my research with an iPad. If I read a book, I like I can buy it for nine bucks. Boom, I can have it since in a minute, and I can search the words out. Right? You search, you get a UFO abduction book, and you want to search out the word owl. You just type it in. There's a search engine for the entire text of the book, and it just so not only does the word owl come up, but other words come up. And if you're like a like a philosophical book or a book, uh, you know, kind of steeped in, you know, mechanical imperial, imperialism, um, it uh, the word knowledge shows up a lot, right? So I have to like I'm not interested in knowledge. I'm interested in the owl. So I have to just kind of swipe past uh, knowledge. And, and I had to say, okay, there's knowledge. Let me get past that. There's knowledge. Let me get past that. I'm not looking for knowledge. And, I, and, I, and there was like, a, a, like an epiphany almost in my deeper sense of this research that I did not want to focus on knowledge. I was moving past knowledge to get to the owl. And that defined my research from that point on. Like I have to loosen up my definition on what reality is in order to, to better wrestle with these things. People have told me some flipped out stories and all I can do is say here's the story that someone told me and then and then and then share it as accurately as I can like if I was clinging to knowledge right I would say I can't put that story in the book it's too crazy but I do put them in and there's a pattern in these in these outlying stories Um, what is the pattern tell us about that pattern 
uh, well, so, so here's something that was happening. Stories would show up. I'd get one story on a Monday and the next story on a Tuesday. I haven't told this story in a long time. I got a couple different versions of it. Um, on Monday, uh, I get a story, and there's a woman named Susan Kornacki. I've been waiting to talk to her for a long time. She's a, an abductee she's, or experiencer. I think she would, she would choose to not use the term abductee. Um, she's had direct UFO contact and retrieved without hypnosis all kinds of experiences in her life. She was at a Easter party. This is these mythic elements, just to you know, Easter Sunday. She's this, so she's at this. It actually, she was having weird feelings going up and down her spine. So she, and then at this party, it was like boom. Like she said, it felt like a Tesla coil going off. She was all of a sudden confronted with this wild, unimaginably strange feeling rushing up and down her spine and up through her head. She said, "I got to get out of here." So she leaves the party, and her husband and daughter are at the party. And she goes home. She's living in Massachusetts at Easter, springtime. She goes and lays down in the hammock in the backyard right, just to try to chill out and try to make sense of what she's feeling. As soon as she lays down, an owl lands on the, so the hammock's tied between two trees. An owl lands on one tree, and then an owl lands on another tree. So the tree that connects her feet to the hammock, an owl lands there. The tree that connects the head to the hammock, an owl lands there. And they start talking back to and forth to each other, and she feels this energetic rush going up and down her body, right? So the, <clears throat> these owls are hooting. She's in the middle. This rush is going back and forth. I, I can't help but think of like an electronic component on a, on a circuit board, right? There's three components, right. two yeah. owls, and this thing in the middle. Susan Kornacki is the thing in the middle, and these the energetic rush is going. It's like her batteries are being recharged by two, like a positive and negative owl. Her husband comes home, and she says, What's, what, do you, what do you see? And he says, well, there's an owl there, and there's an owl there, and they're hooting at each other. She's like, uh-huh. No. Leading up to that event, she had been having this nagging feeling like I need to do like healing work. I need to do energy work. Afterwards, the phone just started ringing. People were saying like, Susan, I got this thing I need to work done. Can you come and do like, can you help me with this problem I have with this sore back? And just, you know, and so she, did they zap her with like energy healing owl magic? I don't know. That's certainly what it seems like. Yeah, now, it that seems that Monday, way. On Tuesday, I get a <clears throat> I get a call. It's like, oh, Mike, here's this great story. Here, I'll send it to you. And it was written up as an essay. And it was from a woman named Kelly. And Kelly had had, now she's very cautious to give this name, and I'm not going to say, but she's had the kind of experiences that a UFO abductee described. I'll leave it at that. And she was, she was aware that she'd been having these experiences, and she wanted some confirmation. She's lying in her hammock in her backyard, and she says, I need confirmation. So she would close her eyes. Beautiful, sunny day. She would close her eyes and count down from 10. Maybe if I open my eyes after counting down from 10, I'll get some sort of confirmation. She opens her eyes. Nothing. She does it a handful of times. Nothing. Her little son, who's, <clears throat> who's about 10 years old at the time, he's in high school now, um, comes running and he climbs in the hammock. He's like, Mom, what are you doing? And she says, I'm playing a little game. I'm closing my eyes. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I want to play it. So he t- takes charge. And he says, okay, let's close our eyes. Dear God, can we see a UFO? Three, two, one. And they open their eyes, and there's a crystalline ship hovering above the trees. Oh, just my goodness at gracious. the tree line of their backyard. <clears throat> wow. So, so this, we also have the husband. The husband shows up, and oh, she takes the little boy, goes in, into the house and gets binoculars, and says this incredibly clear view of an ice cream cone-shaped UFO that was made out of crystalline, magical sparkling magnificence. She said it was reflecting every color in the spectrum in colors she had never even conceived of before. So her very pragmatic husband takes the binoculars, give me those things. And he looks at it and he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and, he like, and he like, the thing is slowly descending. So she sort of describes him like they stayed in the hammock and as it descended, he could walk further into the yard and get along. So he's like walking around trying to figure this out. Okay. Story on a Monday, story on a Tuesday. I tell you this without any, I am, if you put Susan and Kelly side by side, they they don't look like twins. That would be incorrect, but they look like sisters. They are, they are, it's remarkable. So, so there's this uncanny the resemblance 40, between the two of them? Uncanny. Mm. It's 43 miles apart. The wow. See, this is what makes so me how do think. You, what do you, how do you, uh, so yeah, so this is, so you asked what the pattern was. 
I'm saying the pattern is weird stuff. There, that I'll say it. That's the pattern is it gets really weird. So like, <laughs> there's a little uh, 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 Ann Strieber, the wife of Whitley Strieber, her little, she called it her BS detector. She said, I know how to tell if a UFO story is real or not. I have a BS detector. If it's not real, excuse me, if it's not weird, I don't trust it. So that's the pattern. <laughs> this stuff gets so outrageously weird. And, I and like that's, that. I, I've learned to trust that, right? If you get a really weird story, you're a pragmatic UFO abduct, uh, researcher. Boy, a weird story just showed up on my desk. It's too weird. Crinkle, crinkle, you throw it in the wastebasket. Too weird for me. So you got to push past knowledge and, and follow your heart. <laughs> well, again, it, what you're talking about with this uncanny resemblance between the two women, and then I'm thinking back earlier to our conversation about the the OWLs in so many people's names that have to do with this phenomenon. And I'm thinking, is there an owl tribe? I mean, are human beings part, some humans, part of an owl tribe, and they're connected this way. So maybe some people are like you are more apt to have these experiences and be called by the owl than others. And I don't know. I mean, it just seems unusual oh, well, why those two women, you know, I know you don't. So That's the weird finding, thing about you. What I am, <laughs> what I am finding is well, Chris that made and you feel Christopher Knowles, Christopher Knowles and mm-hmm. Christina Knowles, the name Christopher, Christina, my story was Kristen. I have uh, mm-hmm. Christopher, Chris, Christina, Christian. Those, so I, the first five, those, that's the, obviously some of those are pretty common names, but they are showing up with a ridiculous consistency in my research, right? I mean, mm. my, Mike and John, and Mike, John, and Jim are the first three most common boys' names. And I'll tell you, I got more Chris's than Mike, Jim, and John. Now, um, the first five letters of those names, it doesn't get much more mythically charged than Christ, you know? So what it, yes, what, what, that's right. Like, this, this archetypal stuff is emerging, right? Susan Kornacki, Easter Sunday. I have another person who had a, people have called that a, I've had other people come in and say, oh, that was a Kundalini awakening. That's what, that's the definition of an energetic rush up the spine, shooting out the top of your head. Right. Yes. And then, I know another UFO abductee, same day, Easter Sunday, 2010, had a Kundalini awakening, totally in Chicago, you know, 900 miles away. Same day, Kundalini That's awakening, amazing. Easter Sunday, 2010, both UFO experiencers. You know, you were talking know about Christine I mean, this is, and Chris. Oh, go on. The name Chris and Christine is such, they're all extremely sensitive. Okay. Those names, extremely sensitive. Yeah. And what about, yes. PK, what these, about OWL? Oh, what does OWL in the numbers add up to be? The uh, O is a 6, the W is a 5, and the L is a 3. So actually you've, you've got a, a 5. It's all about change when you're looking at it. Because the, the, so the 9, yeah. But the, with the, with the Chris what, or Christine, any of those, they're all extremely sensitive, and they feel a lot. Of, and there's more of a feminine side to them as well. And I will say that the owl is a much more feminine creature, right? So, that, so in, in mm-hmm. mythology, right, so um, Zeus and Jupiter were, had, the, had the eagle, right? So that's a masculine. It's out in the daytime. Right. It's It's... It represents the sky. It hovers and flies in the sky. The eagle is a masculine image of the daytime sky. The owl is a feminine image of the nighttime sky. So the owl is a very <laughs> feminine image. Um, mythologically, a lot of bird goddesses, bird woman goddesses in, in like mm-hmm. ancient, ancient, you know, they've, the first little pieces of artwork that were made out of pottery and clay often picture a oftentimes pregnant, but a bird woman goddess. Mm-hmm. You know, well, and the, also, the PK, you said it's the symbol the of the day. O-W, right, and the moon, the feminine also. The but but with night. OWL being a five, what you're talking about is change. And that's what you said, right. Mike, happened to you when you encountered the owl, is that right. the owl made you change something profoundly in your life to the point where it wasn't comfortable, 
but it was a, a massive change for you. And you said it wasn't an easy it one. Was but it was not comfortable. It was a. It was, it was a, a big. It was a. It was a challenge, and I had. Well, to, and you think about. I basically had to owl. suck it up and deal and say like, like it was not letting me go. Like I, people say, why did you pick owls to study? And I said, I didn't. The owls picked me. <laughs> I did. So. They sure did. Oh my God! This is oh here's, phenomenal. here's a quick story. This, so so um, yeah, please. This doesn't have anything to do with UFOs, but a woman. Um, She's now a grandmother, a happy grandmother. And it, during her teenage years, which would have been in the early 1970s, she was very depressed. She um, was going to commit suicide. She got in her car, and she had a spot picked out in the woods, a little turnoff in the woods. And she was driving there at night, and in the car she had a hose and a pillow. She could lay her head on the pillow in the back seat and bring the hose into the car. And she was turning into the spot. Driving down the road, she was about to turn into the spot where she was going to park her car. And this owl flies right up to the windshield, and she describes the owl hovering for about 15 seconds, and they locked eyes. Now, I'm not sure an owl can hover for 15 seconds, but that's the way she describes it. They locked eyes. Owl flew off. She had a good cry. She turned around and came home. Wow. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, absolutely everything about this stuff could be summed up in that story. You're dealing with a, a powerful symbol of change. She, mm-hmm. she, she, she's now, she's still with us. So. Just incredible. Amazing. Oh my goodness. The power of these, this archetypal animal. I mean, it just, this bird is amazing. Now you were mentioning something about the feathers of the owl and we didn't get to get into that yet. What is it about the feathers right. that you wanted to tell us about? Oh, this, I mean, so owls are very, um, I mean, they're, how would you describe, I mean, they're, they're like very advanced stealth technology. So owls have big wings, and they have special feathers. And on one side of the feather, if you look at it, it's all kind of frayed and frazzled. And, and then they, uh, the, it's, I can't remember, the leading edge or the trailing edge with the flying. I think it's the trailing edge. And what it does is it muffles the sound. Now, owls, if you... And I've seen them. It's pretty gross. They have pictures of owls. I've seen them of owls with all their feathers pulled off. And a little owl skeleton is pretty dinky, right? So an owl with all its feathers pulled off looks like a scrawny, ugly stork or something like that, you know? So it's really skinny. <laughs> but that's not what they look oh, like thanks. when you see them. They look like a big barrel, right? You know, you see an owl sitting there. It's like a big yeah. barrel. And, it does. And you can take your finger and you can push it in, um, you know, and you can get about two digits in before you touch the owl itself. That, that feather is all just fluffy, fluffy, sound-absorbing technology. Mm. So then when owls fly silently, like, you know, whatever, whoever, God did a good job at creating the owl. I mean, the, the mouse has, doesn't stand much of a chance. So, <laughs> That's for sure. Gosh. And that, that fluffiness is there to absorb the sound. Are, huh. they, are they heavy-footed, though? Uh, someone said something about when, when they walk, if say like they land on a roof and, and you hear them walking, they said that they're very heavy footed. Is that true? Well, it's interesting because some owls do spend time on the ground, but most owls you'll they'll only be on the ground when they catch a mouse. They'll fly right up to a tree mm-hmm. and eat the mouse. So owls actually look kind of funny when they walk, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, and you know some owls do spend burrowing owls always spend a lot of time on the ground and then um there are no trees in the far north so the snowy owl spends a lot of time on the ground but um i don't know if they're heavy footed but what i've also I've talked to a lot of people who have held owls they're very light because it's the illusion is that there's this mm-hmm. big heavy thing but most of that's feathers so if someone gives you a leather glove and lets you put it put an owl on your hands they're pretty light that's something they're magical in so many ways they really mm-hmm. are so what other stories have you heard that are more of the paranormal variety, Mike? <laughs> How many, what are we going with, so we can run this on until tomorrow or something like that? Or, I don't know. I got a lot. I got a lot of them. I got more stories than your show can find. I mean, you you do. Know, <laughs> Let me think for a second. So here's one that I love telling. So there's a friend of mine named Ben. He, um, he has had, again, I'm not, the guy to call anyone a UFO experiencer, but he tells the kind of stories that a UFO experiencer will tell. Um, He has a missing time event. 
and he was driving with his kids and they were coming home from a birthday party and all the kids and the neighbor's kids were all in the car and they, they like, his name is Ben. Ben, tell a story. He says, here, I'll tell you a story. He says, what the heck? I'm going to tell some, some of my weird paranormal stuff. So he tells a handful of stories and he tells it kind of playfully for the kids, but he's driving and he's like, realizes it's the first time I ever told these. I don't tell these. And he, and then the fluff, the culmination is a missing time event. So he finishes the missing time event part of the story just as he gets to the punchline and I was missing time. An owl flies right in front of his windshield. Oh my Here's goodness. Here's the guy. Here's ah. the guy telling his first time telling his stories to anyone pretty much. I guess he's shared it with a few people, but really basically coming out of the closet to his kids. And an owl flies in front of the windshield. It happens simultaneously. Story boom owl. Good grief. All at the same time. So he, so later he takes his kids out for a hike in the woods. And this owl is laying in the tree, and they walk past this owl, and the owl watches them walk past. The owl flies along the path and lands in another tree. And the kids walk past them, and like, it's the same owl. And then they watch it fly along the path, and they pass it the same owl repeatedly. The kids loved it, and, and Ben was freaked out. <laughs> ben was kind of freaked <laughs> I out. Daddy so was. <laughs> they, they, that night they go home, and he says, okay, I'll go upstairs. I'll read you a story. And, and they, they go, great. So they pull a book out at random, and they hand the book to him, and he reads a story called Say Boo. I feel really proud that I could put this in the, it's in the, uh, 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 it's footnoted. I got the footnote, this little kid's book in my, in my uh, text. So the story of, is about Ben the ghost, and it's Halloween is coming, but Ben has like lost his voice. So he, instead of saying boo, like he goes up to a cow, and instead of saying boo, he goes moo, right? You get how this is going for a little kid's book, and he can't scare the cow, and he goes up to an owl, and and he's going to say the punchline of the thing, but she doesn't get to it. The punchline is, which I've, is, he would go up to the owl and say he wants to say boo to scare the owl, but he goes who? Now, before he gets that line, the line in the book is he's Ben is reading it aloud to the kids. The line is, and then Ben looked up in the tree and saw an owl, and bark bark bark. The dog's going crazy downstairs, so he runs downstairs. That's the last words he said. He runs downstairs, opens the back door, and there's nothing out there. And he looks up in the tree and sees an owl. Mm. The, the last words he spoke were, Ben looked up in the tree and saw an owl. He gets down there. He looks up in the tree. Actually, it was a pine tree. Ben looks up in the pine tree and saw an owl. He looks up in the pine tree and sees an owl. During the, during the back and forth, during the back and forth, uh, correspondence that Ben and I have, right? So I'm writing it. It's not my story. It's his story. I, I, I got to tell his story accurately. And we go back and forth. And he's like, well, you know, one little thing, correct that part right there. So we go back and forth. He was great to work with. And then as we're doing this, he goes, you know what? I got these two stories. They're the same story. One is me finding my voice. I'm driving the van. This is a profound moment for him. I am finding my voice. I'm speaking my truth. I'm finding my voice. Like he... He was unable to say that until he told the kids, woof, an owl flies by. The, the Ben, the ghost, can't find his voice. And he's, and he's looking for his voice. And then he goes down. So that's the story in the little kid's book is the same story. Someone who's lost their voice. Now, I, I am, I, I just think, so there's a story with no UFOs in it. There's, and, but there's but all this synchronicity. Has everything to do with Oh, powerful mm-hmm. synchronicities. Powerful synchronicities. And he, his, his outlook had changed. He now tells these stories. He's talking about these things in a more public way than he would have before. Because yes. of my writing. Because he was reviewing my, my written text. Incredible. Wow. See the power of all this. Now, there was a movie a while back called The Fourth Kind, and it was about abductions, UFO abductions that were taking place in Alaska. And the owl had a prominent role in that movie. I'm sure you must have seen that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, so that movie, my sense is, so that was, that was touted to be a real story. And that was, it was fictitious. It was, that was a publicity stunt. You know, they had like, uh, you know, in the beginning, they said, this is a real story. But I'm all for a good publicity stunt for like a B-grade scary movie. Now, the, um, the, they had obviously read 
the UFO abduction lore. It's all over the place in the books. As I said before, a sentence here, a paragraph there, where owls show up in the context of UFO contact. So they didn't have to invent that part of the story. That was already that was already part of the literature. So my sense is they just they mined the uh, you know they just pulled out from the existing literature that owl thing. And yes, owls are super creepy. There's all kinds of every movie that has a creepy scene at night has an owl hooting off in the distance. Um, yeah. So that's, <laughs> so that's you're right. the archetype too. There. Yeah, I, I'm, and I and I believe me, I keep track of it. It's it's, you know, and then I'm very uh, self aware of UFO movies. Like ET has, there's there's owls that show up when when ET, you know, the, the little ETs are all collecting their little mushrooms and stuff like that at the beginning of the movie, and they all hear an owl hooting off in the distance. Oh, you're and, right. You know, they, and they all stop yeah. and they listen to the owl hooting. It's like three minutes into the movie. Yep, I remember that. That's yeah. Wow. Well, there's so much of this, but again, I'm still left, Mike, with the thought that there is so much more to this, just more than I can even wrap my mind around, around at this point. Well, I think that, there's I, just my, yeah. My sense Go ahead. is it's more than we can, we we're capable as humans. I think we're stuck on this side of some grand divide, right? Mm-hmm. The mystery yes, is yeah. on the other side, right? So maybe God can understand the mystery. Maybe after we die, we can understand the mystery. But right here in this meat costume that we're wearing, we, we cannot truly <laughs> understand, right? Maybe a shaman in a, in a, in an, in a village in, in Brazil could explain it with a little more clarity. But I mean, the shaman in Brazil is going to explain it a little differently than the shaman in, in Siberia or the shaman in, in, you know, in Southern Arizona. But, mm-hmm. um, yes. So there's, but, but we are we are stuck on this side. So I've given up trying to solve it. But I agree completely that it is it is there is a depth and complexity to this that leaves me thunderstruck. And that's why the second book, the subtitle is um, Owls, UFO, and a Deeper Reality, because that's what I sense is symbolic of the owl is this deeper reality. I mean, you read these the second book is these longer stories. I remember before I said like, Oh my God, you tell any story, you got to tell 10 different stories to lead up. And then every thread connects everywhere. The, the, right. the uh, goal of the second book was to tell these very complex stories and include every detail I could just to, just to give people an idea of the complexity of these stories. And, um, you know, it points to, it feels like, you know, we're on the chessboard and there's some grand chess master that's invisible looming above us and just kind of like, let's, arrange the pieces like this and just make mm-hmm. make the impossible possible. Yes, I think you're right. And so I mean, there's been a lot of talk about that, that we are just a, a computer simulation. So there's, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be said about who's pulling our strings and who's giving us, doling out little pieces of the truth uh, just a little bit at a time. But you have done a great job in bringing this to our consciousness. To our awareness mm-hmm. now what if somebody wants to get a hold of you and share their owl story what's the best way for them to do that mike well so at this point you said earlier i was known as the owl guy um i mean <laughs> if you're anywhere in the world i just got a, i just got an email from romania yesterday a great amazing beautiful story from romania <laughs> and oh, so good. if if, and so if you're anywhere in the world and you sit down at your computer and you had an you like oh my god that you, you had an, an experience with an owl and a UFO, you run into the house, you Google owls, UFOs, my, my name is the first thing that comes up. And then you scroll down and down and down. And it's about the next 15 things that comes up too is all me. So if anyone in the world had an owl and UFO experience, they're going to find me within about two mouse clicks. And, okay. and right on the top of my website, it says, I want to hear your owl stories. And so you can just, oh, great. Uh, my website is the easiest one is Mike and that's kind of a, a place to take you to a, a, to the other website in a way, which is hiddenexperience.blogspot.com. Okay, mikeclellan.com, that's the easy one. And also the mm-hmm. names of your books, uh, The Messengers, Owl, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee, and Stories from the Messengers, Accounts of Owls, UFOs, and a Deeper Reality. The great books, everybody. Go out and get them. You, you will be oh, transfixed yes. by this mystery. And, Mike, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show tonight. Please let us know when your next book is out. We're going to have you back because we're going we're gonna to keep going with this one. It's a great, great topic. And thank you. Thank you so much for all of this 
information tonight. It's been terrific. Good. I'm delighted. So next week, everybody, will be back. We're going to be talking with our buddy Nick Redfern about some very strange stuff going on. You know, Nick's on top of it all the time mm-hmm. when it comes to strange cryptids. He's going to be talking about parasite type of cryptids and things that are, oh, we're going to have to get into this one big with Nick. So anyway, <laughs> everybody, we'll For join sure. you next week again, and we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Until then, take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another radio adventure with Supernatural Girls. Thanks again, Mike. That was terrific. Great show. I think he's gone. Talk to you in the morning, Patricia. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.